field. Good afternoon. Welcome to this integrated seminar on malaria. I will be talking about malaria in children. <clears throat> so, I will cover a little bit of uh, epidemiology. What is the trend in changing the epidemiology? What are the clinical features specifically in children? What is what are, how to make a diagnosis? and a little bit about congenital malaria and then how to manage it. In management, initially you have to identify what is the severity and then treatment of non-complicated and complicated pneumonia. And at the end, I will discuss a little bit about prevention. If you see, this is the data of uh, number of cases, falciparum and number of deaths due to malaria over last 20 years and you can see that in the beginning of this century there was a significantly high number of cases in our country and subsequently now it is reducing significantly. Same thing is for the case fatality and uh, the number of cases dying due to malaria is also low. Though it may be that it is probably uh, under reporting but still the trend shows that there is a significant reduction in the malaria related incidence of malaria as well as deaths due to malaria. If we see around 2.5 million reported cases from Southeast Asia and India contributes to three fourths of it, 75%. And if you see though it is a old uh, uh, map, but it might have uh, improved uh, to some extent more than two-thirds of our population lives in malaria affected parts of our country and around 117 districts in India are chloroquine resistant suggesting that it is a significant public health problem. <clears throat> what are the clinical features of malaria? The first and foremost is fever. Fever is the cardinal symptom of malaria and it is being said that suspect malaria in cases with fever in a endemic area or after recent visit to an endemic region. It can be intermittent with or without periodicity or continuous. And this is important to understand that in pediatric patients in children, it is not necessary that it will occur intermittently or every second or third day with chills and rigors. It may be continuous fever and many cases may have a chills and rigors but not necessarily in all. <clears throat> so that is very important to understand. Often accompanied by headache, myalgia, arthralgia, anorexia, nausea and vomiting. So these are known specific, but fever associated with headache, myalgia, arthralgia, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, think of malaria specifically if a patient is in endemic area or has traveled recently. On examination, there may be anemia, splenomegaly, splenic enlargement, hepatosplenomegaly, and if these with the clinical features and the endemicity, if there is a hepatosplenomegaly along with anemia, think of malaria. But in certain uh, 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 clinical features, if there is a other alternative cause to explain fever, something like signs of respiratory infection. Diarrhea, dysentery, burning maturation suggesting UTI, lower abdominal pain, skin rashes or infections due to viral exanthema including dengue infection, lymphadenopathy. If some of these are there and you can explain the episode of fever by these uh, diagnoses, in that case malaria becomes less likely. Sometimes there may be combination of these two, so we should have a high index of suspicion. How to make a diagnosis? The gold standard for making a diagnosis is examination of smear, peripheral blood smear. In India, slides for MP are stained using GSB stain. Advantage of making a GSB uh, uh, smear, blood smear is it has a good sensitivity and can detect low parasite. 
it is rapid easy and less expensive and species can be identified on smear examination there uh, and you can at the same time have some uh, uh, assessment that what is the parasite density suggesting that what is the load of parasite in the body however it is a operator dependent you need a trained person who can examine these uh, smears properly so it is important to know that uh, you have to prepare when you are making a smear two types of smear one is thick blood smear and another is thin blood smear and how make a thick blood smear you take two or three blood drops quickly join the drops using sides or corner of the another slide and stain it appropriately as you can see here two three drops and then you can make it thick films are used for detection of malarial parasite and thin film you use only a single drop spread using another slide keeping at 45 degree stain appropriately and then thin films are used for identification of species of malarial parasite both thick and thin film should be routinely prepared this is a gold standard since this has a limitation of a trained manpower which may not be available in peripheral area so we have a rapid diagnostic test and the uh, principle is of a immunochromatographic test and it is based on the capture of parasite antigen from the peripheral blood and it uses monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies against antigen targets in the malarial parasite as you can see here these antigens are one is plasmodium falciparum hrp2 histidine rich protein 2 that is specific for uh, falciparum malaria and another one is pen malarial antigen pma and that uh, is against the uh, uh, these these includes selected dehydrogenase and aldolase a uh, use of rapid test is based on uh, based on antibody detection are not recommended because these are these are antigen based rdts but there may be some antibody uh, uh, based test also but they are not uh, uh, useful for countries like ours where there is a baseline prevalence of malarial infection is more and people may have antibodies against it advantages of rapid diagnostic test include it has a good sensitivity of more than 95% no special equipments are required minimal training is required and test reagents are stable at ambient temperature no electricity is needed disadvantage is high cost and inability to quantify the density of infection if hrp2 based kits may show positive result because there may be uh, for next 2 uh, to 3 weeks after the infection even when we have already treated it so that is a disadvantage so recommendations for use of rdt include ensure that the kit is within its expiry date transported and stored under recommended conditions and users manual should be read properly and instructions followed meticulously the results should be read at the specified time so national vector uh, bone disease control program supplies these rdt kits for detection of plasmodium falciparum at locations where microscopy results are not obtainable within 24 hours of sample collection because it is important as we you will see that uh, severe malaria is an emergency so you cannot wait for indefinite period even more than a uh, few hours also so uh, all negative rdts should be screened by smear because rdt may be negative at a low parasite density all positive rdts should be subjected to smear examination for species identification because it will not identify you will not be able to say whether it is a ovel or malaria and obviously you will be able to quantify the infection uh, 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 what is the parasite load in an individual <clears throat> you can see it is so easy that there is a strip this is a, 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 a for uh, uh, this thing falciparum malaria 
you put a drop of blood over here and then you see the uh, 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 markings over here and then uh, within 15 to 20 minutes you may be able to say that yes this child is having malaria and some of them may be able to say tell us that yes it is a false sperm or it is a vivex so let us see this case before we go on to the management a 5 year old boy weighing 15 kilo presents with a history of fever four days four days high grade intermittent with chills no rigors no cough gi symptoms so fever without localization intermittent and very high grade with some chills so he is febrile conscious vitals are stable no respiratory distress some pallor no jaundice liver is 1 cm and spleen is 2 cm soft and non tender as we have discussed that in endemic region fever intermittent with chills no other obvious focus and hepatosplenomegaly with some anemia it uh, points towards malaria so clinical diagnosis is obviously it is malaria and his hemoglobin is 9.8 tlc total leukocyte count is 9300 polymorphs 45 lymphocyte 48 and eosinophils 3 monocyte 4 percent in peripheral smear is positive for cytont you can see here cytont of uh, p vivex and rdt is also positive by pen malarial antigen <coughs> so diagnosis is p vivex malaria then how to decide that uh, what treatment is to be given so the first thing is that you decide whether it, it is a severe malaria for a non complicated malaria treatment is different as compared to severe malaria and you can decide it based on some clinical parameters and laboratory parameters if you look for clinical among the clinical parameters clinical criteria you look for cns problems like impaired consciousness coma repeated generalized convulsions uh, circulatory collapse or shock bleeding or disseminated intravascular coagulation hemoglobinuria pulmonary edema or acute respiratory distress syndrome hyperpyrexia with a temperature of more than 166 degree fahrenheit or more than 42 degree centigrade among the laboratory parameters renal failure a creatinine of more than three jaundice bilirubin of more than three severe anemia a hemoglobin of less than five and hypoglycemia with a plasma glucose of less than 40 if you are able to do a blood gas then metabolic acidosis or if more than five percent of the rbcs are parasitized that is hyperparasitemia if any of these are there then you can say that this child is having a severe malaria so in present case they do not have any the child doesn't have any uh, clinical evidence or laboratory evidence to support severe malaria so we make a diagnosis of uncomplicated vivex malaria and he is 15 kilo so you give a chloroquine for such patients and the total dose is 25 milligram per kilo of the chloroquine base and so you will give 10 milligram per kilo on day one day two and five milligram per kilo on day three so 150 milligram on day one 150 milligram on day two and 75 milligram on day three and at the same time you will give primaquin to prevent relapse of the disease and there are 2.5 milligram tablet you give one and a half tablet daily for 14 days and if fever is there for control of uh, pyrexia you give paracetamol chloroquine dose chloroquine is a bitter uh, uh, medicine so there may be some vomiting so it should be repeated if the patient vomits within half an hour uh, of uh, administering the drug but if he has a repeated vomiting even second vomiting that indicates that there may be a serious issue and in that case you have to treat it like a severe malaria so the treatment is if it is a non complicated vivex malaria drug of choice is chloroquine along with primaquine so many a time say if you are working in a peripheral area where 
weight is we you cannot measure the weight of the child in that case the drugs can be given doses uh, the medication can be given as per the age of the child so for example if a child is less than a year then you will give half a tablet of 150 mg on day 1 half on day 2 and 1/4 on day 3 if it is 1 to 4 then 1 1 and half and accordingly 5 to 8 2 2 and 1 and if it is more than 15 years of age it is something similar to that of an adult 4 4 and 2 so total of 10 tablets course is being given and this should be given after food to avoid gastritis and vomiting <coughs> same thing is for uh, uh, this thing primaquin you can give uh, a 2.5 mg a uh, tablet one tablet for 1 to 4 years two tablet for 5 to 8 years four tablets for 9 to 14 years so this is important to understand that malaria may occur in peripheral area where may or may not have a possibility of weighing the child or sometimes child is so sick that you cannot make a weight so we have a possibility of uh, giving it according to the age of the child can we prescribe primaquin without testing for g6 pd deficiency primaquin one of the important side effect is that it can cause hemolysis in a child who is having a g6 pd deficiency so certain regions of our country has a very high incidence of g6 pd deficiency so in those situation it is indicated that patient should be tested for g6 pd deficiency if facility is available but it should be given if uh, 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 facility is not there you give it without testing it but explain to the family that it should be stopped immediately if there is a dark color urine suggestive of a hemoglobinuria if child develops a jaundice suggestive of your hemolysis or there is abdominal pain so preferably give primaquin after doing a a uh, g6pd uh, test but if that is not possible give it with this instruction to the family so for uncomplicated alzheimer malaria what should be the treatment so treatment is artemisinin in combination therapy act and primaquin on day 2 a single dose <clears throat> this is to minimize emergence of a drug resistance and recrudescence and uh, our program national program recommends artesunate 4 mg per kilo daily for 3 days along with that sulfadoxin that uh, 25 mg per kilo plus pyrimethamine 1.25 mg per kilo on day day 1 itself or day 2 artemether with lumefantrine another alternative in which syrup is 20 mg and lumefantrin is 120 mg per 5 ml and you can have a tablet also 20 and 120 40, 40 and 1 240 and artemether 80 and 480 so you can use either and again uh because of uh, this weight and the uh, other problem Uh, in our national program we have different color of the blisters available for our act so for below 1 year it is a pink blister 1 to 4 year it is a yellow blister 5 to 8 year it is a green and 9 to 14 it is a red and above that 15 years and above it is a white blister and you can give artesunate one tablet along with sulfadoxin one tablet on day 1 day 2 and day 3 only a uh, artesunate is to be given so this this helps us even to our uh, peripheral workers who are working in a tribal area where malaria is endemic so that they do a test and immediately can administer the medication <laughs> according to the age of the child appropriate doses so let us see the second case four year boy weighing 13 kilo he presents with a fever for five days high grade intermittent occasional vomitings occasional cough is there he is having convulsions since morning and unresponsiveness for more than half an hour since morning receives drugs to abate seizures before coming to hospital 
physical examination he is unconscious febrile with a respiratory rate of 34 per minute slight tachycardia 112 per minute blood pressure is maintained 90 by 64 there is a pallor petechial hemorrhages liver is 3 cm and spleen is 2 cm so in an endemic area if there is a fever though there is mild cough but that cannot explain his other clinical features of convulsion seizures and unresponsiveness along with pallor so obviously diagnosis is that it is malaria and because of this high grade intermittent uh, fever with uh, convulsions and unresponsiveness it makes it a severe malaria so hemoglobin is 6.3 that is okay 12 uh, 12400 total leukocyte count with 54 polymorphs and 41 lymphocytes platelet counts are low 68000 and malarial parasite ps is negative but rdt is positive for falciparum and so it becomes because of cns manifestations it becomes a falciparum malaria severe and as i said it's not necessary that you may be able to identify malarial parasite in peripheral smear in acute severe malaria in some cases it may be negative because of sequestration of parasite in the microcirculation so that's why rdt is positive and you should be starting the treatment so severe malaria is an emergency and treatment should be given promptly as soon as possible once you have identified to reduce the mortality as well as sequelae parenteral artemisinin in derivatives or quinine should be used irrespective of the chloroquine sensitivity and supportive therapy is intravenous fluid symptomatic therapy and artesunate compounds it, it can be given in doses of 2.4 milligram per kilo either intravenous or intramuscular at admission after 12 hours and after 24 hours so this is must that we give parenteral anti uh, anti-malarial to all the children and you can dilute artesunate after parenteral admission in therapy patient will receive a full course of oral act for three days avoid mefloquine containing act in cerebral malaria due to increased risk of neuropsychiatric complications so you will use this conventional act uh, either uh, uh, these uh, 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 you can see here that uh, uh, either combination lumifentrin artemether or artesunatin sulfadoxin if due to some reason not able to give uh, artemisinin in compound or artemether in that case you have to give quinine 20 mg salt per kilo intravenous infusion at admission then 10 mg per kilo 8 hourly and reduce the dose to 7 mg per kilo 8 hourly if IV therapy is needed for more than 48 hours. So in the beginning you will give 10 mg per kilo 8 hourly and subsequently you will reduce it to 7 mg per kilo. Quinine infusion is given in a 5% dextrose or dextrose saline over 4 hours. So it should be slow infusion because rapid infusion or bolus may be associated with complications in form of a, a cardiac arrhythmias or there may be hypoglycemia so that's why you will not give loading dose if patient has already received quinine once patient can take orally say in two days or three days time you can switch over to quinine 10 milligram per kilo eight hourly to complete seven days of treatment and as, along with a clindamycin 10 milligram per kilo 12 hourly for 7 days. So, this is the combination treatment for severe malaria if you are not able to give artemisinin or artemether compounds. The parenteral treatment in severe malaria cases should be given for minimum of 24 hours, 0, 12 and 24 hours irrespective of the patient's ability to tolerate oral medication and subsequently you can give a ACT. Prima Quinn is given a, 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 a according to the specific, uh, species for falciparum it is a single dose 0.75 milligram per kilo and for vivex it is for 14 days 0.25 milligram per kilo daily for 14 days so what is the difference between these two artis artisunate and quinine 
IV or IM artesunate shown to significantly reduce the risk of death compared to IV quinine. IV artesunate is associated with lower risk of hypoglycemia than IV quinine. No difference in serious neurological sequelae on day 28. IV artesunate does not require rate controlled infusion or cardiac monitoring for side effects as compared to quinine. If it is a vivex malaria but clinically and laboratory wise it falls in the category of severe malaria, it would be treatment would be similar to that of a false pain. And however, primaquin will be given for 14 days if it is a vivex severe malaria. If facilities for treatment do not exist, as I said, if I am working in a tribal area, peripheral area where malaria is endemic. In that case, I may not have all the facilities. In that case, I may have to refer the patient. But after giving first dose of quinine, even intramuscularly, I will ask my paramedical persons to give it and then refer it. Prevent hypoglycemia while the patient is going to a higher center by encouraging breastfeeding to a small infant or child or if child is not able to suck on the breast 10 milliliter per kilo express breast milk can be given. If uh, 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 it is not possible then animal milk with added sugar can be given and in older children you can give sugar water prepared by adding 4 teaspoons of sugar to 20, 200 milliliter of water to prevent hypoglycemia and its consequences. And if fever is there, you can give paracetamol. So a little bit about uh, a word about uh, congenital malaria. Malaria is acquired from mother either prenatally or perinatally. And it is an important cause, malaria is an important cause of abortions, miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, intrauterine growth retardation and neonatal death in mothers. Congenital malaria usually occurs in a non-immune mother, non-endemic area, mother is staying in a non-endemic area and then gets the infection with either vivex or malaria. Although it can be observed with any of the human malarial parasite like false sperm and others also. It present, usually it presents after 10 to 30 days of age. Say mother had a malaria in the last trimester of pregnancy and delivers a baby. So the baby at 10, between 10 to 30 days may develop congenital malaria clinical, clinical features of congenital malaria. But it range, it can happen as early as 14 hours to several months of age. So that should be kept in mind. And the child may have a fever restlessness, drowsiness, pallor, there may be jaundice, poor feeding, vomiting, diarrhea, sinusis and organomegaly. So if a mother has got a malarial infection and then the baby is presenting with any of these, there is an organomegaly with pallor and the child is drowsy, restless, jaundice, anemia, think of congenital malaria and uh, then treat it as per the uh, uh, whether it is a severe, non-severe and similar medications are to be given. <laughs> so how to prevent malaria? So it is at all the levels people have to take up precautions. At individual level, regular use of mosquito net is the best way to prevent malarial infection in a malaria endemic region. At community level, indoor residual spray of a DDT or synthetic pyrethroids. Insecticide treatment mosquito nets or long lasting insecticide treated nets uh, may be used and that may be effective up to three years. So to conclude, malaria is, uh, uh, the clinical features of malaria is fever with chills and rigors. Specifically in children, we should be aware that the classical Every third day with chills and rigors may be absent. Diagnosis is microscopy with Zimsa stain slides, still the gold standard. RDT are useful tests for diagnosis. For uncomplicated PYVX, chloroquine is recommended. For complicated falciparum to be treated with ACT. And uh, oral artemisinin monotherapy is not being recommended in India. 
फॉर सीवियर मलेरिया आई वी आर्टिसोनिक और आई वी क्वीन इज फर्स्ट लाइन एंटी मलेरियल एंड सब्सिक्वेंटली वंस द चाइल्ड स्टार्ट एक्सेप्टिंग ओरली यू गिव ए सी टी फुल कोर्स विनिन थेरेपी कम्बाइंड विद खिंडामाइसिन एंड आर्टिनोक्सुनेट थेरेपी टू बी कम्प्लीटेड विद ओरल ए सी टी पी वाइव एक्स कैन कोर्स विल मलेरिया अर्लियर वी यूज टू से दैट सिवियर मलेरिया मीन्स इट मस्ट बी फॉल्स फेरम बट नाउ वी रियलाइज दैट इवन we uh, plasmodium vivax can also cause severe malaria and treatment is similar to that of a falciparum thank you very much hello can we start now yes sir you can start sir uh, good afternoon to everyone i am doxina i am professor marchin at aims new delhi and uh, thank you for invite uh, from department of pharmacology and i am going to discuss about uh, management of complicated malaria and uh, i am going to discuss in the adult portion i hope professor pakesh lodha have already discussed about in the younger population in the children group and uh, population between uh, Zero to eighteen years of age. So I'm just uh, going to discuss about uh, different kind of things. Like I'm planning to discuss about the epidemiology of malaria in different part of country and world. And uh, then I'm going to discuss about the common investigation. I'm not going to discuss in much detail because I am just focusing on the things which are required at your level. And then I'm going to discuss about the different protocol for the management of malaria. So, and then I'm going to discuss about the combination therapy. I'm just starting about with the concern. What is the concern of the malaria? Why it is so important? and uh, so as we know that uh, malaria is the most prevalent disease in the world and more than one third of the world's population live in the malaria area areas and about 100 to 300 million new cases annually and 1 to 3 million deaths annually 90% from tropical african countries and rest of 10% occur in about 100 countries and two third of these are from brazil india and sri lanka so you can see that there is a large amount of malaria is also from india and nearby country like sri lanka and brazil and in south east asia in the accounts are 80 percent of all cases so it's a large number of cases coming from different part of india so this is as per the who data and if you see that uh, india in india the most parts of the country about 90% of malaria is unstable and mostly we see the endemic areas like northeast states which are efficient for malaria transmission in the maintained during the most months of the year and we have like intermediate level of stability maintained in eight states of india these are andhra pradesh jharkhand gujarat madhya pradesh chatisgarh maharashtra odisha and rajasthan so what is malaria like uh, malaria disease can be acute or chronic and it can be caused by four species of parasite it could be falciparum it could be vivax could be ovel or malaria so in our country we have we see mostly falciparum and vivax and in delhi area mostly we see in vivax but we see falciparum also because it's a lot of referral cases from different part of country to aims and other hospitals in delhi 
So what is the incubation period? So plasmodium falciparum have two days, 12 days, Vivax 14 days, OVL also 14 days, and malaria is 30 days. So coming to the specific signs and symptoms of the malaria disease, and there is a typical kind of symptoms, like we have classical cyclic paralysis, like you can say, you can Patient can have cold stage, hot stage, sweating stage. So what happened in the cold stage? Patient have chills and shaking with high grade fever. And then comes to the high, hot stage where patient have warm body and headache, severe headache, and patient can have severe bouts of vomiting also. And then coming to certain stage, after hot stage, patients have lots of search in the body and feel weak. So there are three kind of stages. It's very important to understand in the malaria fever, like cold stage, hot stage, and certain. And generally, fever associated with the chills and rigors or chills with shaking, with sweating, with high-grade fever. So... It's a typical kind of fear. If you have this kind of symptoms, then immediately we have to do rapid test for malaria. These kits are available in different uh, wards and uh, emergency and if and in OPD also. And if malaria is positive, then we have to start the treatment as per protocol. So here you can see that fever is about 96%. Fever with chills is also 96%. And then patients have headache, muscle pain, palpable liver, palpable spleen, nausea and vomiting, and abdominal pain. And diarrhea is not very common, it's about 6%. So coming to the falciparum malaria, it is kind of severe disease. And it is also known as complicated malaria or malignant Russian malaria. And if you see that appropriate treated, uncomplicated falciparum malaria carries a mortality rate about 0.1%. However, once vital organ dysfunction occurs or the proportion of erythrocyte infected increases to the more than 3%, then mortality rises to steeply. Coming to the diagnosis of malaria. So if patient is having clinical symptoms, as I said earlier, then if there are typical clinical symptoms of high-grade fever with chills and rigor, sweating, headache, body ache, and sometimes vomiting and diarrhea, then we can do the test for the malaria and accordingly we can start the treatment. And to confirm the diagnosis, we have following test. We have microscopy where we can make the thick film and we can make the thin film and then we can do the capillary test or QBC assay or fluorescence. And we have other rapid diagnostic tests like antigen capture test and PCR and PCR test. And coming to the parasite count it is also very important because based on the parasite count, we can identify the severity of disease. And based on that, we have to treat the malaria disease. So coming to the parasite count, so what is what they are doing, the method of assessing the severity of infection in falciparum malaria, it should be done routinely in all cases of falciparum malaria to identify the severity of disease. And the parasite count of one lakh per microliter or five percent and more is considered to a severe infection or severe falciparum malaria. And this also helps in recognizing the response of the treatment. If we do this test in the follow-up and there is a decrease in the count parasite count, then we understand the anti malaria treatment is responding to the patient. Then coming to flow cytometry. The flow cytometry and automated hematology analyzers have been found to be useful in indicating a diagnosis of malaria during routine blood counts. The automated detection of 
malaria pigment in white blood cells may also suggest a possibility of malaria with a severity of 95% and a specificity of 88%. So coming to the rapid diagnostic test, these are very popular nowadays because we get diagnosis within 20 to 30 minutes. So we have kind of rapid kits where we take the blood and we just do the test at the kind of on the lab or point of care test and we get the result within 20 to 30 minutes. And these are very helpful there is no need for microscopy. It depends on the detection of falciparum histidine-rich protein. It is called HRP2. And sensitivity is about 92% and specificity is almost 99%. So you can see these kits are very highly specific. So diagnostic value is very high. And there are certain limitations also like Patient cannot, these kits, there are some new kits which can diagnose plasmodium virus also, but some old kits are unable to diagnose those. So coming to the optimal test, this is also important test where we see the plasmodium lactate dehydrogenase or PLDH, a rapid and easy alternative of existing test, recognition of all major form of human malaria, differentiation between the pelsiferum and Vivex malaria. Operation in all clinical setting, it monitored the success of drug therapy, and it monitored the detection of drug resistant malaria. So these are some important points which we can see in optimal test for detection of malaria. So coming to the QBC test or quantitative Buffy code, this is also an important test and we use more in the research point of view. And you can see here a high precision glass hematocrit tube pre-coated with the acridine orange is filled with 55 to 60 microliter of blood. And they see the sensitivity is claimed to be as good as thick smear. So coming to the PCR and ELIJA testing. The PCR sensitivity is around 95% and specificity is almost 99%. So it's a highly specific test. And ELIJA is used for the detection of serum IgM and IgG against plasmodium falciparum and sensitivity is around 78% and specificity is 95%. So coming to the anti-malarial drugs, so these are the drugs list in table. So I've just taken this table from Pope and uh, I just want to show you different kind of drugs available for the management of Malaria. So I hope you have already been taught by Professor Jagrati Bhatia. She has already taken in detail. So I'll just give you a brief overview. And here you can see that we have different kind of drugs, including quinine, quinidine, mefloquine, halofantrine, and then we have chloroquine, then we have folate synthesis, synthesis inhibitors like type 1 and type 2 drugs. And then we have primacoin, tetracycline, antibiotics like tetracycline, doxycycline, clindamycin, azithromycin, fluoroquine, and alls. And then we have artimeter, uh, artisonate drugs. And then there are some more drugs like etorvacoine. So there are different kind of drugs. There's a long list of drugs, but nowadays we have found that certain drugs which are very uh, effic efficacious against the malaria, like artimeter and uh, artisonate, and due to there is a high chances of resistance, we don't use them as a single 
drug we are using as a combination therapy against malaria to treat malaria to avoid any anti-malaria drug resistance. So coming to the anti-malaria drug resistance, it's a kind of ability of a parasite strain to survive and or multiply despite the proper administration and absorption of an anti-malaria drug in the dose normally recommended. The anti-malaria drug resistance is not necessarily and not necessarily the same as malaria treatment failure. The treatment failure can also be resolved to the incorrect dosing, problems of treatment adherence, poor drug quality, interaction with the other drugs, and compared with the drug compromised drug absorption or misdiagnosis of the patient. So there are some common risk factor or causes due to that patient can get the anti-malaria drug resistance. So coming to the treatment of uncomplicated plasmodium falciparum malaria, and here we use uh, the anti-malaria combination therapy. So what is the definition? Coming to the definition, the anti-malaria combination therapy is the simultaneous use of two or more drugs with different biochemical talkers in the parasite and the independent modes of action. And it is like kind of fixed combination medicine products, and it is free combination co-administered in the separate tablets or capsules. So what is the rationale behind anti-malarial combination therapy? As we discussed earlier that there is a widely established resistance of fluoroquine and sulfur toxin pyramitha, pyramithamine combination. So based on that, there was a lot of research happened and there are certain theoretical phases of communist therapy are like protect individuals drug against occurrence of resistance to decrease rate of decline in the efficacy and to interrupt the spread of resistance strain and to decrease the transmission in a region. So there are some basis on based based on these theoretical basis, there is a combination therapy performed or manufactured. So coming to the artemisinins, and as I discussed before, that artimeter and artisanates are backbone of treatment for the malaria nowadays. And it's a very effective drug against the malaria. So coming to the short half-life, hence good for combination. So these drugs are having sort of half-life and they are because of that, very good combination for the treatment of malaria. They are having rapid, substantial reduction of the parasite biomass. They can use for the rapid resolution of the clinical symptoms and effective action against the multi drug resistant plasmodium falciparum and reduction of gametocyte carriers and no documented parasite resistant yet and few reported adverse effects. So these tracks are very popular because of these, I mean, qualities or these uh, less side effects. So they are using following combination as per international and WHO guideline. We can use the combination of artemether plus lumefantrain and then we can use the artisanate plus Amadeo coin, and we can use the artisanate plus sulfur, sulfur and toxin and pyramethamine, and we can use the combination of artisanate and meflo coin. So there are four combinations available, which are very popular, and these are available in the tablet form and liquid form or injectable form. So I'm going to discuss some injectable injectable form in next few slides. So these are generally given for three to five days. 
So there are certain guidelines or combination which cannot be recommended for the treatment point of view, like chloroquine based combination, example, chloroquine plus sulfur toxin paramethamine and chloroquine plus artesunate cannot be used. Artesunate single dose plus sulfur toxin paramethamine cannot be used and chlor chloroprogonel and dapsin cannot be used together. So here is the recommendation as for WHO guideline. The treatment of choice for un uncomplicated falciparum malaria is combination of two or more anti-malarial drugs with the different mechanism of action. The anti-malarial combination therapies are the recommended treatment for the uncomplicated falciparum malaria. The following ACTs are currently recommended, which I discussed in the previous page, previous slide. The choice of anti-malaria combination therapy is a country or region will be based on the level of resistance of the partner medicine in the combination. So in areas of multi drug resistance like Southeast Asia, we use artesunate, mefloquine, or artemether, limifentrine. Then in Africa, we use oh, artemether limifentrine or yeah. artesunate plus amadea coin yeah. plus artesunate yeah. and sulfadoxin and paramethamine. So the oh, artemisin yeah. and derivative components of the combination must be given for at least three days for the optimum, optimum effect of the drug. The artemether Limefentine should be used with a six dose regimen and amadequine and sulfadoxin paramethamine combination may be considered as an interim option in the situation where antimalarial combination therapy cannot be made available. So these are the very important guidelines. So I'll just request you, you can note down briefly and then you can see in detail in your book, in your textbook. So what should be avoided? The partial treatment should not be given even when patient are considered to be semi-immune or the diagnosis is uncertain. The RT medicines and the partner medicines of the anti-combination therapy should not be available for the monotherapy. So these guidelines, these instructions are very important. We have to follow these. And then coming to the treatment of pregnant women. So recommendation for the first trimester of the pregnancy are quinine and clindamycin combination. And for the second trimester and third trimester, the guidelines are anti combination therapy being used in the country region or artesunate plus clindamycin or quinine plus clindamycin. So these are some very important guidelines for the management of pregnant women who are suffering with malaria. So coming to the treatment of lactating women, the lactating women should receive standard anti-malaria treatment, including anti-combination therapy, except for tetracycline and dapsone. This should be with her during the lactation. So infants and children treatment already told by Dr. Professor Rakesh Sloda, so I'm not going in detail. And treatment in travelers, the following antimalarials are suitable for use in the travelers returning to the non-endemic countries like anti artemether lemon lemon pentrine, six thousand regimen, atavacoin and progonel combination and quinine plus toxicycline or lindamycin combination. So this is kind of a treatment for the different kind of malaria and coming to the severe malaria. So this is the last slide I'm telling you what is the immediate clinical management for the severe manifestation and complication of falciparum malaria. So when there is a kind of a severe involvement or there is an involvement of 
different organs in the fever malaria. So we have kind of a multi-organ dysfunction, morts, and we have involvement of pain, brain, and we call it cerebral malaria, and patient can go in coma if there is delay in the management. So what we do in the cerebral malaria, if patient is in coma, we maintain the airways, we place the patient on his side, and then, if required, then we intubate, provide any aspiration. We treat for hyperglycemia. We treat for rule out other diseases like bacterial meningitis. Then avoid harmful ancillary treatments such as corticosteroid and uh, intubate if necessary. Then there is a hyperpyrexia in severe malaria which is due to underlying severe malaria. And we treat high-grade fever with the help of paracetamol. We do cold sponging, and we use injectable antipyretic drugs also. And if patient is having seizures, then we maintain airways, treat promptly with the intramenous or rectal digipalm or intramuscular parahaldehyde. Then coming to the hypoglycemia, if patient is having low blood sugar, then we have to check the blood glucose and treat the hypoglycemia. And if patient is having severe anemia, then we have to transfuse the blood transfusion. And if patient is having acute pulmonary edema due to underlying ARDS, then we have to maintain the oxygen level. And if required, then patient needs to be intubated. In case of acute renal failure, we need to treat the failure, uh, failure, and if required, then we need to do hemofiltration or hemodialysis. And in spontaneous bleeding and coagulopathy, we need to treat them by using vitamin K injection. And if required, then we have to give the, transfuse the skin threshold blood. And in case of metabolic acidosis, we have to exclude or treat the hypoglycemia and hypovolemia and septicemia. If severe, add hemofiltration or hemodialysis. And in case of SOG, when there is a secondary infection, bacterial infection, and can lead to suspected septicemia, then we have to do the blood culture and we have to treat the patient with high grade antibiotics. So I'm just going to stop here. And I think it's more than enough at your level. If you have any question, then I'm ready to answer. Thank you very much. Dr. Shravan, is there any question? Uh, uh, one minute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, no questions sir, from student side. So you can take the attendance for the student, okay? Uh, yes, sir, I will take. Sir. Okay. And uh, can I log out now? Yes, sir, you can log out, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank thanks, thanks for arranging this. Okay, okay. Sir. bye, sir.